everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, uh, which is our last webinar here of 2016. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Carville, and I will be both moderating and presenting the webinar today. So before we begin, let me just go over how the webinar will work. You may have noticed that your phone has been muted. However, I do encourage you to ask questions along the way. Just type your question into the chat dialog at the right and select Send to Host. I will be taking questions at the end of the talk. I'll also be posting the video recording of the webinar later this afternoon or tomorrow morning, so look out for an email from me with a link to this recording. To introduce myself, I am the Marketing Director here at ICT. I work very closely with our R&D team to put together this webinars program, helpful blog posts, and keep our products launching on our website. In addition, I also frequently am the booth representative at trade shows, so hello again to any of you who I just saw at the Neuroscience Conference. So now as we move forward, in addition to your questions, if you do have any ideas for future webinar topics that you'd like to see, feel free to chat those in as well during the presentation today. So today's talk will be focused on looking at Alzheimer's disease, discussing apoptosis, necrosis, pyroptosis, and oxidative stress and discussing some associated ICT fluorescent detection products that can help you study Alzheimer's or other neurodegenerative diseases. Just to give a little bit of background on ICT, we are located in Bloomington, Minnesota, which is a suburb just south of Minneapolis. ICT just celebrated its 22nd anniversary in September, so we have been in the immunoassay business for quite some time. So here at ICT, we offer both service projects as well as products, and I'll provide some more detail on these offerings shortly, but did want to make a note that all our products are for research use only and not for use in diagnostic procedures. One product line that I wanted to briefly touch on is our ELISA solutions. Now these include all the components that you need to build a better ELISA. The coding buffers, blockers, sample and assay diluents, conjugate stabilizers, and wash buffer all work together to minimize the buildup of unwanted proteins to generate a very clean signal. These products do work together to address common issues you might encounter during ELISA development, such as specificity, sensitivity, reproducibility, and shelf life. Our ultimate goal is to help you develop optimized ELISAs that have a high specific signal and low background noise. Now that's all I'll mention about our ELISA products today, but if you do have questions about this particular product line, feel free to chat them in and I can get you a response after the webinar. Now with our expertise in ELISA development, we do offer a variety of immunoassay related services. Our scientists have years of experience with protein chemistry and ELISA optimization, so we can help you develop reliable, sensitive, and specific immunoassays. We can also scale up and manufacture an assay for internal use for our clients. So if you're in need of a service project, feel free to reach out and get in touch, and I'm very happy to facilitate a discussion with our R&D scientists to discuss your project and your goals. The product line that we'll focus on for today's presentation is our cell viability assay kits. These cell viability assays include a large range of fluorescent whole cell assays for intracellular apoptosis detection and cellular analysis. ICT's line of assay kits can detect apoptosis, necrosis, intracellular caspase activity, cell-mediated cytotoxicity, activated serine proteases, oxidative stress, mitochondrial membrane permeability, and much more. So these kits are designed for use in whole living cells. No lysing of the cells is required here. Now, some of you might be longtime users or have heard of our popular Flicka product line for caspase detection, but we do offer so much more in a wide range of fluorescent applications. So today, we'll first give a little bit of background on Alzheimer's disease, discuss the difference between apoptosis and necrosis pathways and how they play a role in Alzheimer's, explore the role of oxidative stress, and finally, discuss pyroptosis and how it impacts neuronal diseases. Now, as we work through these main topics, we'll also discuss the related detection kits offered by ICT and look at some example data. To get started today, I did want to briefly touch on the reach of Alzheimer's disease. So as the most common form of dementia, Alzheimer's is a progressive disease with symptoms typically beginning as memory loss after 60 years of age, and symptoms gradually worsen over a number of years. 
the disease impacts the parts of the brain involved with thought, memory, and language. Over 5 million people in the U.S. currently live with Alzheimer's disease, and it is the sixth leading cause of death among U.S. adults. It's estimated that by 2015, or 2050, excuse me, the number will almost triple to about 14 million people. So there is currently no cure for the disease, and the cause and mechanisms of the disease are still largely unknown. However, research continues looking for treatment options to help Alzheimer's patients and their loved ones. There are several hallmark pathological characteristics of Alzheimer's disease, uh, synaptic, nerve lo or synaptic loss, nerve cell loss in the cerebral cortex, hippocampus, and amygdala, extracellular deposits of amyloid beta protein that form senile plaques, and the intracellular precipitation of hyperphosphorylated tau proteins that form neurofibrillary tangles inside the nerve cells. While we still don't know exactly what causes this specific pathology, there are several different hypotheses researchers are pursuing in the quest for developing a treatment for the disease. First, the acetylcholine deficiency hypothesis is based upon the associated decrease of acetylcholine synthesis in Alzheimer's disease, which is a neurotransmitter necessary for memory and cognition functions. This was initially a very popular hypothesis and drove drug development to treat this acetylcholine deficiency. However, to date, these treatments have not proven to be very effective, so other hypotheses are being pursued. The oxidative stress hypothesis looks at the link between the presence of oxidative stress and much of the pathology associated with Alzheimer's disease. And we'll talk about oxidative stress in much more detail later in the presentation. The amyloid cascade hypothesis is another central approach that's being focused on for pharmaceutical research and focuses on the amyloid beta peptide. This hypothesis looks at the processing of APP, a precursor protein to amyloid beta. The protein cleavage of APP can go in several different directions, some of which include a form that readily aggregates into the hallmark plaques of Alzheimer's disease. This particular hypothesis is also supported by genetic findings, finding mutations in the APP gene, among several others. Now, ultimately, despite the diversity of approaches, the targets for Alzheimer's disease treatment still need to be discovered, but these hypotheses summarize some of the current thinking in the quest for these targets. And now that we've covered some of the pathology and current thinking in terms of Alzheimer's research, let's shift gears a little bit to discuss cell death, which is a major event present in many neurodegenerative diseases. When we're talking about cell death, apoptosis and necrosis are two different mechanisms of cell death, although those mechanisms can sometimes overlap. Apoptosis, or programmed cell death, is a process controlled by genes. These genes can be activated from a variety of environmental stimuli, including DNA damage, oxidative stress, or exposure to things such as hormones, viruses, drugs, or other toxins. In looking at necrosis, this process is not programmed and does not rely on gene transcription. Rather, this is a pathological event that happens when there is trauma to cells. As we can see in this table, there are some very real differences in the features of apoptosis and necrosis. Apoptosis is generally characterized by the shrinking of the cells, the membrane blebbing, and the condensation of the chromatin. These cells then fragment into small apoptotic bodies that are phagocytized by macrophages, meaning there is not associated inflammation with apoptosis. In contrast, necrotic cells in mitochondria swell up, the DNA degenerates, and the membrane disintegrates and induces a huge inflammatory response. So here's just a visual representation of the two processes side by side. So on the right, you can see a shrinking of the cell and that blebbing and fragmentation. And on the left, you do see the swelling and the lysing of the cell. Now, caspases are the enzymes underlaying uh, the apoptotic process. Now, caspases, or cysteine-dependent aspartate-directed proteases, are activated and then go on to cleave substrates leading to the eventual disassembly of the cell. There are two different groups of caspases, those involved in apoptosis and those involved in inflammation. In terms of apoptosis, imitator caspases 
uh, I'm sorry, initiator caspases regulate apoptosis upstream by initiating caspase cascades, while effector caspases are responsible for proteolytic cleavages that lead to cell disassembly. Inflammation is heavily dependent on the activity of caspase 1, which is associated with inflammasome activity and is a key housekeeping enzyme in its conversion of pro-interleukin-1 beta protein into the active interleukin-1 beta cytokine. We'll talk more about inflammation in our discussion of pyroptosis later in the webinar. Now, in this diagram, we can go ahead and walk through the programmed process of apoptosis for those who may not be familiar. Now, apoptosis is typically initiated through two different pathways, the intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway. The intrinsic pathway is activated following cellular stress, which results in mitochondrial perturbation and the release of cytochrome C. Once released, cytochrome C binds to apoptotic protease activating factor 1, triggering the formation of the apoptosome complex, resulting in the activation of initiator caspase 9. Activated initiator caspase 9 then processes and activates effector caspases 3, 6, and 7. The extrinsic pathway is initiated following the activation of death receptors of the TNF superfamily. The trimerized receptor ligand complex recruits procaspase 8 to the death-induced signaling complex via the FAS-associated death domain, leading to the rapid activation of caspase 8. Activated initiator caspase 8 then processes and activates effector caspases 3, 6, and 7, which are responsible for the phenotypic changes associated with apoptosis. During cell-mediated cytotoxicity, the granzymes released by the cytotoxic T cell enter the cytoplasm of the target cell through the pores made by perforin. The granzymes, which are serine proteases, can directly trigger the caspase cascade, leading to apoptosis. Alternatively, apoptosis can also be induced through cell surface interactions between a cytotoxic T cell and an infected cell. When a cytotoxic T cell is activated, it starts to express the surface protein FAST ligand, which can bind to FAST molecules expressed on the target cell. Engagement of FAST with FASTL allows for recruitment of the death-induced signaling complex, and then the FAST-associated death domain translocates with the DISC, that death-induced signaling complex, allowing recruitment of procaspases 8 and 10. These caspases then activate the effector caspases 3, 6, and 7, leading to cleavage of death substrates. And the final result there is apoptosis of the cell that expressed FAST. Now, in terms of Alzheimer's, there is a proposed hypothesis in which amyloid beta triggers the activation of the caspases, leading to proteolysis of tau and neurofibrillary tangle formation. So this hypothesis links both the presence of amyloid beta deposits and the neurofibrillary tangle pathologies. The proposed pathway here shows the amyloid precursor protein APP cleaved by beta and gamma secretases forming amyloid beta. In one pathway, amyloid beta aggregates into oligomers, resulting in the production of reactive oxygen species. These reactive oxygen species then induce oxidative stress, resulting in cell death. In the alternative pathway, or possibly simultaneous, uh, amyloid beta activates the caspases. The active caspases then cleave critical cellular proteins, as discussed on the last slide, such as actin, fodrin, and tau. When these proteins are cleaved, the cytoskeleton is disrupted. With tau in particular, this cleavage could result in hyperphosphorylation, also contributing to destabilization in the skeleton by impacting microtubules and axonal support. Eventually, the cytoskeletal disruption, destabilized microtubules, and impaired axonal transport would result in neuronal cell death. There's also the possibility that caspases once activated would facilitate a positive feedback loop, as the caspases are known to cleave APP, continuing this whole process. So if you are studying Alzheimer's disease in relation to caspase activity, how can you detect whether caspases are active in your cell culture? ICT's FLICA kits, or Fluorescent Labeled Inhibitor of Caspases, offer an in vitro whole cell detection method to study caspase activity in apoptotic cells. These assays are available for a variety of different caspases, as well as polycaspase activity. 
The samples can be analyzed using a flow cytometer, fluorescent plate reader, or fluorescence microscope, and are available in green, red, and far red options. So now let's go ahead and delve into how FLICA works. Now the FMK group on the FLICA probe forms a covalent bond with the reactive catalytic sites on the active caspase enzyme. This enables the FLICA probes to be retained inside the cell despite the subsequent wash steps. FLICA is not cleaved by the caspase. Once the FMK reactive groups on the FLICA probes form covalent bonds with the two catalytic cysteine groups within each of the two caspase reactive sites, that particular caspase enzyme is rendered essentially inactive. It can no longer cleave any substrates. So knowing how FLICA works, we can now go ahead and examine some data examples of FLICA in action. We'll just cover a couple of examples today uh, in terms of time, but I did select these examples because they are neuroscience specific. However, if you check out our website or other webinar recordings, we do have other flow data, plate reader data, et cetera, in a variety of contexts. So for this particular experiment, cryopreserved primary neuronal cells from the rat brain were thawed and then grown in cell culture. The goal here was to show the sensitivity of cryopreserved brain neuronal cells for plate-based cell culture assay of drug-induced neurotoxicity. Hydrogen peroxide was used to induce oxidative stress and then was stained with FLICA to show the apoptotic neuronal cells over time. In this image, we are looking at mouse neuroblastoma cells that were treated with hydrogen peroxide and stained with FLICA to label caspase-positive cells green and with Hooks stain to label DNA blue. And as you can see in both of these cells, apoptosis was induced as indicated by the green fluorescence. So one other kit I wanted to mention in this section of the webinar is our necrosis versus apoptosis kit. And as discussed earlier, these two types of cell death are both important in Alzheimer's disease and in other cell culture studies. This kit allows you to identify both apoptotic and necrotic cells within a single sample. Apoptotic cells are identified using ICT's FLICA reagent probe. Loss of the integrity of the cell membrane, indicative of necrosis or late stage apoptosis, is detected using the vital staining dye 7AAD, a red fluorescing live dead stain. This dye easily penetrates cell membrane compromised cells, binding tightly to GC rich regions of the DNA. Now, 70 AD alone will not be able to detect cells in early stages of apoptosis as the cell membranes are still intact and are capable of excluding 7 AD. As caspases are active during early apoptosis, combining FAM FLICA with 7 AD can provide a more detailed picture of the overall health of the cell population. Combining these two different types of fluorescent cell status indicator reagents within a single test can reveal a significant percentage of cells that are 7AAD negative, so membrane intact live cells, and yet FAM FLICA positive, apoptotic. This kit can be analyzed using fluorescent microscopy or flow cytometry. So we can see here in this image that the early stage apoptotic cells are stained green. The necrotic cells only exhibit red fluorescence and we do see some green and red fluorescing cells that are in late-stage apoptosis. So shifting gears now again, I want to begin to discuss oxidative stress. Now, under normal physiological conditions, cells control reactive oxygen species levels by balancing the generation of reactive oxygen species with their elimination by scavenging molecules such as antioxidants. However, under conditions of oxidative stress, excessive reactive oxygen species can damage various cellular components, such as DNA, lipids, and proteins. Now, some of the most harmful effects of reactive oxygen species exposure are the damage of DNA, oxidation of polyunsaturated fatty acids and lipids, which is also known as lipid peroxidation, oxidation of the amino acids found in proteins, and the oxidative deactivation of specific enzymes. Now, in the research surrounding Alzheimer's disease, evidence of oxidative stress manifests through increased levels of highly oxidized proteins, DNA, and lipids, higher amounts of free metal ions that can generate free radicals, advanced glycation end products, formation of toxic species including peroxides, alcohols, aldehydes, free carbonyls, and ketones, 
and oxidative modifications in both nuclear and mitochondrial DNA. In addition, research shows that Alzheimer's disease-associated amyloid beta induces an oxidative environment for neurons, as we examined during our discussion of caspases. So this figure examines some of the sources and effects of oxidative stress, both on a molecular level and cellular level. Now, the error catastrophe theory for oxidative stress in Alzheimer's posits that positive feedback loops are created in neurodegenerative diseases that contribute to the pathology of the disease. In Alzheimer's, it is believed that damage to cell constituents occur while at the same time cellular defense mechanisms weaken. Because of this, the cell cannot repair the damages quickly and efficiently, and damages continue to accumulate, leading to the loss of function of the neurons and ultimately to the neuronal cell death. At ICT, we do carry a growing line of oxidative stress assay kits, and I'm only going to cover three of the kits today, uh, the ones that are highlighted in red, which is our intracellular total ROS activity assay kit, our DNA damage ELISA kit, and our intracellular GSH assay kit. However, if you are interested in learning more about any of the other kits, we do have a full webinar recording on oxidative stress that describes all of these different methods of detection. So first, I'd like to introduce our intracellular total ROS activity assay kit. The total ROS kit utilizes a proprietary oxidation-sensitive probe called total ROS green. And on its own, the cell permeate dye is non-fluorescent, but when in the presence of intracellular reactive oxygen species, this dye becomes oxidized to its green fluorescence-capable form, making it easy to detect by common methods such as flow cytometry. The histograms here uh, depict the flow cytometry results from Jercat suspension cells that were preloaded with total ROS green and then were exposed to tert butyl hydroperoxide to induce the production of reactive oxygen species. The increase in ROS activity is evident in an overlay histogram which is shown at the far right. The mock treated cells are represented by the black line and the tert butyl hydroperoxide treated cells are represented by the red line. So here you can see a nice shift in median fluoride fluorescence intensity. Now, while not entirely fluorescence-based, as the webinar title promises you, uh, I did want to briefly touch on our ELISA kit for the quantification of 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine. And our kit is compatible with a variety of sample types, including urine, cell culture medium, plasma, tissue samples, and saliva. The assay utilizes an 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine-coated plate with an HRP-conjugated detection antibody that is specific for 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine. This kit can detect levels as low as 0.59 nanograms per milliliter. A typical standard curve is shown in the graph on this slide. And as this is a competitive ELISA, the greater the concentration of 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine in the sample, the lower the end signal. How this works is that the greater amount of 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine in a sample, the more likely the detection antibody will bind to the free 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine present in the sample instead of binding to the 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine coated on the plate. Now, only the detection antibody that has bound to coated 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine will be retained and, direct and detected. Uh, any of the free 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine that is bound to the antibody will be washed away. So next, ICT also offers a kit for detecting intracellular levels of glutathione. Our intracellular GSH assay kit provides all of the essential reagents for monitoring changes in intracellular glutathione activities, uh, intracellular glutathione levels by flow cytometry. Now, the key reagent in this assay is the thiobrite green dye. This proprietary thiol reactive dye quickly penetrates cell membrane structures and accumulates primarily within the cytosol of live cells. In the presence of free thiol containing molecules such as glutathione, the non-fluorescent thiobrite dye covalently binds to glutathione. This process converts the dye to its green fluorescence capable form. During periods of oxidative stress or glutathione depletion associated with cell death processes, such as apoptosis, the cytosolic concentrations of the green fluorescent dye form become significantly diminished. The reduction in intracellular GSH concentration directly translates into an easily monitored reduction in green fluorescence output within the dying or oxidatively stressed cell population. 
Now, sample flow cytometry results are shown at the bottom of this slide. So here, Jerkat cells were either treated with DMSO as a negative control or were exposed to sterosporin for four hours to induce apoptosis. The effects of sterosporin on the level of intracellular glutathione can be seen in the overlay histograph. The green line represents the GSH levels in the mock-treated cells, and the red line represents the diminished GSH levels in the apoptotic cells. So the last topic that we'll cover in today's webinar is pyroptosis. Now, pyroptosis is a highly inflammatory form of programmed cell death. This pathway is distinct from apoptotic cell death in that it results in plasma membrane rupture and the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Infected cells eventually swell, burst, and die. This, in turn, attracts other immune cells to fight the infection, leading to inflammation of the tissue and, in a functional response, rapid clearing of the infection. In looking at this figure, we can see the pathway to the activation of the NLRP3 inflammasome. Oligomerization of the NLRP3 inflammasome is triggered by two signals. The first signal begins with the recognition of pathogen-associated molecular patterns by toll-like receptors such as TLR4, which through an interaction with the adapter protein MyD88, triggers activation of the transcription factor NFK-beta. Once activated, NFK-beta is translocated to the nucleus, where it leads to the synthesis of the inactive pro-inflammatory cytokine pro-interleukin-1 beta. Another potent pro-inflammatory cytokine precursor, pro-interleukin-18, is constitutively expressed. However, its expression is increased after cellular activation. The second signal is triggered by an ionic perturbation in the cell, such as an efflux of potassium ions caused by the ATP-dependent activation of the pyrenogenic P2X receptor, which subsequently results in the assembly of the NLRP3 inflammasome, caspase-1 activation, and IL-1-beta and IL-18 secretion. Now, pyroptosis is a factor in both acute and chronic aseptic inflammation in the nervous system, making it a mechanism of interest in a variety of neurodegenerative diseases. In Alzheimer's disease, enhanced expression of IL-1-beta and IL-18 has been observed in the nervous system. So this figure illustrates one hypothetical model that links amyloid beta to the NLRP3 inflammasome to pathology of synaptic dysfunction and neuronal death. The amyloid beta peptide could induce the activation of the NLRP3 inflammasome through potassium ion fluxes or phagocytosis. Once activated, the NLRP3 inflammasome activates caspase-1, leading to the secretion of IL-1-beta. IL-1-beta could go on to induce amyloid plaque formation, neurofibrillary tangles, and neuronal death. So to detect pyroptosis, IT, ICT offers our brand new pyroptosis caspase-1 assay kit to detect caspase-1 activation in cell cultures. Nigerisin is included in the kits as a positive control for your pyroptosis studies. The kit is currently available in green fluorescence and can be analyzed with a fluorescence microscope, fluorescence plate reader, and flow cytometer. So in this figure, THP1 cells were treated with either a negative control, non-induced, or PMA to induce differentiation into macrophages, which are the induced. Uh, after 48 hours, PMA was removed from the induced population and replaced with fresh medium containing LPS to induce caspase-1 activation. Cells were stand with, stained with our FAM YVAD FMK probe, washed, and then examined with a microscope. In the treated sample, many cells appear bright green, indicating an increased level of caspase-1 activity. In the non-induced sample, few green cells are visible, indicating a low level of caspase-1 activity. So as you're planning out your project or working through an experiment, we do have a variety of resources available on our website to help you. Uh, you can find webinars such as this one on a wide variety of topics, so simply go to our archive on our webinars page to access those recordings. We also have some short product demonstration videos if you'd like to see some of our popular kits in action. And I periodically update our blog with helpful tips, 
news citations, and company announcements, so check there for all your ICT news updates. And finally, we have extensive documentation in the forms of product manuals, safety data sheets, and certificate of analysis that are very easily accessible from our product pages should you need them. If you're looking for more examples of our cell viability assay kits in use, or any of our other ICT products, we do have an extensive list of publications where our products are cited. And as you can see from this publication map, we have thousands of publications from researchers all over the world. If you're looking for specific examples of our products in use, feel free to send me an email. I'd be happy to conduct a publication search for you to highlight a particular product of interest. Now, one of our points of pride here at ICT is our excellent customer and technical support. Being a small company, if you do have a technical question, you can frequently speak to the inventor of the product to get your questions answered and troubleshoot your project. We also offer fast and affordable shipping, quickly sending out orders the next day. Our number one priority is helping our customers achieve their research goals. So that concludes my presentation today. I can now take a couple of questions before signing off. So if you do have a question um, that necessitates a more in-depth technical response or a discussion of your project, I will consult with our R&D staff and follow up with you personally right after the webinar. Um, but feel free to chat in some of those questions. I'll uh, take them as they come. Um, we do have a uh, first question chatted in here. Um, someone's wondering, uh, how sensitive is the FAM Flicka probe? Um, and to, to address that, you know, our FAM Flicka probe is very sensitive. Uh, the reagent can detect natural apoptosis incurring in control cells. So if you do check out some of our other posted data on FAM Flicka, you can see in the control populations that typically about 2 to 6% of these untreated cells are going to naturally enter apoptosis. So FAM Flicka can still detect that naturally occurring apoptosis there. Okay, we have someone else um, asking a question with regards to our oxidative stress component of the webinar. Um, so they're wondering what the most reactive form of all reactive oxygen species is. Um, and the most reactive form of, of ROS, I would say, would be the hydroxyl radical. And this has a single unpaired electron. So that means it can react with oxygen in a triple ground state. The hydroxyl radical interacts with all biological molecules, and it can cause subsequent cellular damage, um, like lipid peroxidation and damage to proteins in the membrane. Um, this would be the most damaging, as cells don't have any enzymatic mechanisms to eliminate the ROS, so its excessive production can eventually lead to cell death. Um, and I think I'll just take, you know, one more question here before we wrap up for the day. But, you know, again, feel free to keep on chatting in those questions as we wrap up. Um, but we do have someone working with fixed cells, so they're wondering, you know, whether they can use our Flicka probe with the fixed cells. And, you know, to answer that question, that really depends on when you're going to fix those cells. So as we talked about, uh, Flicka does need active cast bases to work. So as long as you're able to stain with Flicka prior to fixing the cells, you're going to be fine. Uh, so the fluorescent reagent should remain bound to the cast base during the rest of your procedure. We do recommend that you read your cells within 24 hours and that you avoid using a pure methanol or ethanol fixative, as those are going to quench or reduce the fluorescent signal from the Flicka probe. A formaldehyde-based fixative is included with all of the Flicka kits that you would purchase. So if that is going to work with your experiment, that's what we're really going to recommend there. So that's about all the time that, that we have today. Uh, thanks again for attending and for your excellent questions that are chatted in. Um, if I was unable to get to your question or your question required a more in-depth technical response, uh, we'll make sure to follow up with you personally after the webinar. And again, I'm also going to be sending out the webinar recording within the next day or so. So if you think of any more questions after the webinar or have ideas for future webinar topics, please feel free to send me an email or reach us through social media on Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Uh, so thank you again, everyone, so much for joining us, and have a great rest of your day.